Gov. Um, so um, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this session um, on uh, text encoding. Um, this, today's session is being introduced by Christopher Oge from the uh, School of Advanced Study in London. And um, he's going to give us a, a general introduction to TIXML. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks, Gabby. Right. So uh, in introducing TEIXML, we need to make some important distinctions because most of us, when we're engaging in TEIXML, think purely in terms of encoding. But in fact, the TEI uh, is many things. It's first and foremost a community, so a consortium, international consortium, that is inst institutions, projects, individual members that started in the late 1980s, so very long-standing consortium. And as I said, it's a community of users and volunteers. It's not, um, it's not a commercial enterprise. It comes up with hardware and software independent methods for encoding and archiving humanities data. It comes with a flexible set of guidelines that are usually expressed in, S in XML. I say this because uh, when the TEI was founded, it was expressed in SGML, which was the precursor to XML. Some people now use TEI uh, vocabulary in JSON, JavaScript and um, object notation. So it, it's not dependent on any particular markup language. It can be expressed in many different languages. Um, it's also a tool for producing customized schemas for validating any project's digital text and a set of free and openly licensed style sheets for transformations into many different presentational formats. And finally, it's very pragmatic. It, it, it relies on consensus uh, for organizing and structuring textual resources, images, and other media. And this makes it a an, an excellent archival format for long-term preservation of digital data and for sharing that digital data. This just gives you a sense of the parts of the TEI community itself. Um, as you can see, it consists of a, of a cloud of, of people who um, are part of an executive board, a technical council, which mainly guides, uh, uh, deals with the guidelines and software issues as well as a wide uh, array of users in the academy and in, in archives and libraries and so on. And, and there are also special interest groups which deal with particular issues that the TEI is looking uh, toward expanding in their guidelines. Now, I mentioned earlier that TEI is usually expressed in XML. So I need to spend just a moment explaining what XML is in relation to TEI. Now, first and foremost, XML is a meta language. So it's a language for describing another language. And the importance of this concept is that it gives you the flexibility to design your own XML rules. XML stands for extensible markup language and the extensible bit indicates that it is flexible and that it is a meta language for designing your own XML. And it's also a formal model that represents text in an ordered hierarchy, which is important not only because we think and write um, hierarchically, but also because um, an object, an, an ordered hierarchical content object um, allows for easy parsing of documents on tree structures. Uh, if you're dealing with non-hierarchical flat documents, it's much harder for the computer to process that. Whereas going through uh, an ordered uh, hierarchical content object allows for much quicker um, processing of data and particularly large amounts of data. And it also allows for easy transformations. So what is the difference then between XML and TEI? Well, X, the XML specification details the rules for the language. And that means what elements are delineated uh, with angle brackets and what vocabulary is used. There are other vocabularies that you can use in XML in all kinds of domains. For example, uh, people who uh, publish journal articles use JATS XML, eBooks use BITS XML, and these are other meta languages for expressing uh, consistent rules for journal and book publishing. There's even a beer XML standard. 
the TEI guidelines recommend a specific vocabulary, which is the names of elements and attributes and provide a structure that TEI documents follow. This is an example of a certain kind of TEI document in XML. This is a uh, play. And as you can see, um, we have elements that are nested within each other in a very consistent way. So we see a div element that contains other elements within it. And this again demonstrates the tree structure. Um, if we look at this as a diagram on the right hand side, uh, we see this encoding um, rendered as a tree. And it shows you how quickly the computer can start with a div element and then run through each of its um, its children elements, head, stage, SP, SP, and so on. And within each of those elements, you can contain other elements. And this allows, again, for very logical and consistent processing of textual nodes and information. Most of us will encounter the TEI guidelines through the TEI's website, which is linked at the top here. And what you'll see is a series of introductory chapters about TEI and XML and the text body, which contains the, the chapters of the TEI guidelines. And the back matter is particularly important because it's the way in which we often engage with elements and attributes and many other features. So for example, if you go to Appendix C and select elements, you'll then see a list an, an alphabetical order of all of the elements that are available in the TEI guidelines. Most of us will um, encounter a text and say, oh, um, I'm dealing with a header in, um, in, a, in, a, in a chapter in a book or something. And you'll wonder, well, I wonder if there's an element for head or header. And so you can go to this appendix and click on H and you would see that indeed there is a head element. And then when you click on that, it will give you more information about how to use that element. So that's a really handy way of exploring the TEI guidelines. And even if you don't know the answers, this is a good way to find out how to get those answers. So what can you encode with TEI? Well, basically anything. It takes a general and agnostic approach to any text structure and verbal phenomenon, written or, uh, or nonverbal. Um, so the textual bit is based on a, a codex format, um, but it can work for non-codex material as well. The verbal stuff is mostly based on linguistics, but they're general purpose interpretive tags that can be employed as well. So in theory, as I said, TEI can cope with any text of any size, language, date, complexity, and writing, any system or media. Um, in practice, it might be more challenging to work with non-codex and non-document material, but there are ways to get around that. Now, what does a valid, valid TEI document require? Most of you, when you open a TEI document in, a, um, in an integrated development environment such as Oxygen, will be able to open up a TEI P5 template document. Um, and I should have mentioned this earlier, but P5 is the fifth iteration of the TEI guidelines and the current iteration. So a TEI P5 template document will give you this template here. And what this shows you is exactly what a TEI needs in order to be valid. So let's review those bits. What it requires first and foremost is a root TEI element that points to the TEI consortium's XML namespace. The second bit is a TEI header. A TEI header just contains metadata and that metadata must include a file desk or a file description, which describes the file. This itself must include or must be nested within it, a title statement that contains a title, an author element, and any other information about others responsible for the document, such as editor element. Also a publication statement, which would provide publication details about the electronic text in a structured way or as prose inside a P element. And finally, a source desk, which would list the bibliographic details about the electronic text material source in a structured way or in a P element. Now the third bit is a text element. 
a text element is just a general element that contains the body of the text or front matter or back matter, usually some combination of two or three of those. And within these structural divisions, you usually find further subdivisions that are encoded with div elements. And within those div elements, you often will uh, include type attributes, for example, that specify what kind of division you are looking at. So if we go back to this TEI P5 template, uh, as you can see here with the red arrows, we've got a TEI header and a text element that are nested within the TEI root element. And below the TEI header, there's the file desk, title statement, publication statement, source desk. And within the text element, you can see a body element that contains a P and a figure, which you might may or may not need. But a lot of projects will have the body element followed by some textual material. That's for the main text. Whereas if you have things like introductions, you might include that in a front element for front matter and any kind of appendix material would go in a back element or notes, things like that in the back element for back matter. Now, I need to say something quickly about TEI and constraint. The TEI contains around 570 elements and more than 200 attributes. That's a lot. Most of you won't need all of that. Um, and just like you can't read all the books in the library, you also can't read all of the TEI elements and sprinkle them throughout your text. And one thing that's important to emphasize in relation to this is the TEI is not a schema. Editors typically select TEI elements and attributes from TEI modules that apply to their projects, and that serves as a schema. Or you can create your own schema based on a selection of TEI elements that are relevant to your project. So the TEI is offering an unambiguous foundation for representing text, as well as standardized mechanisms for customizing those texts based on a limited amount of elements. So most projects don't require that many elements. So part of the constraint project is finding out what those elements are going to be required. Usually around 20, 25 elements are needed for most projects. So you're not, um, you're not, you're not uh, required to, to make use of 500 plus elements. Now, what kinds of outputs might you make from a TEI project? Well, it enables you to encode your interpretation of the materials within the source file itself, um, which is again, why it's such a great archival format. What you generate from your TEI encoding is a separate step, but it's important to remember that there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between a TEI project and any particular output, like a single view of a digital edition or a PDF. Anytime you transform TEI, you're, um, you're in some ways losing some aspects of what is encoded in that source data, but because it's in the source data it can always be retrievable and made useful for a variety of views. So you might generate all kinds of views of an edition, including supplementary indexes or research aids, introductory material, critical apparatus, metadata, lists of people and places and objects and other named entities. Um, you might not even generate an edition, but use a TEI XML file for text analysis purposes. Um, you may uh, export into a number of formats. Most people export into HTML and PDF, but even Microsoft Word can be exported, uh, Markdown, all kinds of formats can be generated. Um, and of course, you can also uh, generate um, spreadsheets and other tabular data from TEI as well. And that uh, concludes this introduction to TEI XML, but um, Gabby, uh, if you have any observations or questions, uh, let's do that now. Um, I'm not sure I have anything important. This, this was a very good overview of the, of the topic. Um, I guess the only, um, the only thing I'd maybe come back on is um, you commented that because TEI is um, designed for the sort of codex view of a document, which is absolutely correct. And, and this, this is particularly noticeable in the manuscript description section, which you didn't um, mention, but we'll, we'll, we'll mention in other, in other tutorials. Right. Um, 
so, so therefore it can be difficult to to handle other kinds of objects um and the only thing i'd add to that i mean I, you know you're absolutely correct but the only thing i'd add to that is that there are communities who have um designed you know ways for um, TEI to work with those sorts of objects. So there's, there's you know, TEI for inscriptions of a Pyri epidoc, you know, TEI for other kinds of objects that has been designed. Um, and it doesn't involve, um, you know, reinventing TEI as something different, but just using the existing elements in TEI in a particular accepted way, you know, as defined by that sub-community. So, so there, are, there are solutions to those things. You're absolutely right that, that um, yeah. you know, TEI hasn't by default made those easy, but there are, there are communities who have made solutions better or worse, but, but there are solutions to those sorts of things. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. When I mentioned earlier, the special interest groups, um, that's what they do, right? So mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in special interest groups, the TEI wiki has a list of all of the special interest groups, which include uh, Epidoc, right, um, which you're involved with, but also things like correspondence encoding, which until recently did not have thorough guidelines. There are many other special interest groups, but I'll just want to uh, jump off another point that you made, which is sometimes you have to choose what interpretations you want to focus on with your project, because you'll notice if you get deep into TEI encoding that sometimes Encoding in one way makes it difficult to include with another set of uh, to encode with another set of interpretations. Mm -hmm. So if you try to mix, for example, um, structural poem encoding with linguistic encoding of the poems, you'll notice that there will be overlapping hierarchies of, of the XML and the XML will not be valid or well formed. So um, so there are there are ways in which you need to constrain yourself as well based on the, the research questions that the, that the TEI document requires. And if it turns out that you need multiple means of encoding that tend to overlap, you might have to um, resort to standoff markup or some other um, tricky ways to, to have multiple kinds of models and interpretations encoded. Or encode them in separate documents. I mean, that's the other thing yeah. people sometimes do. They have, yeah, 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 yeah great. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, Chris. Thanks.